Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ian Case. I'm the director of the FARC Auditorium and Ceremonies Events here at U UVic, and uh, I've had the pleasure of working with, uh, with Janet and Nathan, uh, but uh, this is my first time meeting Kevin. Uh, I'd like to go through a few sort of housekeeping uh, bits as well as uh, to, to uh, recognize and acknowledge and uh, I'm going to start that again. We acknowledge and respect the Lekwungen speaking people on whose traditional territories the university stands and the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanich peoples on who, whose historic relationship with this land continues to this day. Uh, it's our pleasure to participate in Alumni Week and to welcome you to this event. Thank you to the Alumni Association for offering up Alumni Week, and this provides us with an opportunity for UVic the UVic's community to come together and celebrate the impacts of UVic's alumni that, uh, the, and, the, what, and the impacts that they're making on our local community and around the world. I'd also like to thank our volunteer student ambassadors, and uh, I am also asked to encourage you to engage in the social media and the flashback photo contests, if applicable. So I don't know if you have any embarrassing pictures of Nathan. So, because I know that there are none of Janet. Uh, I'm going to offer a, a quick bio for, uh, for our speakers today. So Nathan Med has made a career of making space for artistic communities and their work to develop. Most recently, his team at the National Arts Center initiated a new Indigenous theater department on that, uh, to, uh, for that organization, the first national Indigenous theater in the world. And the NAC is now the world's only national theater to be led by three artistic directors representing Francophone, Indigenous, and English-speaking cultures. While at the NAC, Nathan also repositioned the English theater to focus squarely on Canadian stories and storytellers, a significant change for a 50-year-old institution. He left last year at the conclusion of a $225 million building expansion that included new creative public spaces that have been dubbed the living room of the capital. He has been a producer of uh, has been a producer of the Siminovich Prize, one of Canada's most prestigious awards for a theater artist, and he's also led the unique had the unique distinction of producing work and running companies with a number of artists who have earned this prize, including Gillian Ke Keeley, Kylie, uh, Kim Collier, Marcus Youssef, and Bridget Hinkgen. Hate Gens, right? Gens, groovy. As managing producer for Electric Company, he co-founded Progress Lab 1422 in Vancouver, a cooperative performance creation studio that served as an incubator for some of Canada's most innovative new theater. And here in Victoria, he worked closely with Janet and me to create the Metro Studio, which has helped to reinvigorate the theater scene on the island over its 13-year existence. He recently started a new role as Managing Director of Performing Arts at Banff Centre for Arts and Creativity, Canada's largest learning organization for professional artists and arts workers. So, Nathan. <laughs> Janet Munsell is a graduate of the University of Victoria's Theatre Program, where she studied design and directing. In 1992, she joined the staff of Intrepid Theatre, producers of the Victoria Fringe Festival, UNA Festival, Outstages, and other presenting and development programs. Her work as a playwright has been seen internationally, including the National Arts Centre, Theatre Calgary, Alberta Theatre Projects, the Tarragon, Soho Theatre in London, Prague, uh, Prague Fringe, Bell Table Arts Centre in Ireland, the West Yorkshire Playhouse in Leeds, and many others. Her plays include The Ugly Duchess, Emphysema, uh, A Love Story, Be Still, Influence, Circus Fire, and I Have Seen Beautiful Jim Key. Her play, That Elusive Spark, uh, Playwrights Canada Press, so we don't need that, was a finalist for the two 2014 Governor General's Literary Award, and her adaptation of Pride and Prejudice, commissioned and first produced by Theatre Calgary and the NAC, was featured in, uh, in the Arts Club's 2015-2016 season at the Stanley Theatre in Vancouver. She lives in Victoria and is currently an MFA candidate and sessional instructor in the Department of Writing at UVic. Janet. Kevin Kerr is a playwright and founding member of Vancouver's Electric Company, Company Theatre, with whom he collaborated on the creation of more than a dozen full-length productions, including Brilliant, Studies in Motion, and Tear the Curtain. 
He received the 2002 Governor General's Literary Award for his play Unity 1918, which has been produced more than 100 times across Canada and around the world, including here, I believe. Other plays uh, include Skydive, Spine, both for Real Wheels Theatre, The Remittance Man, Sunshine Theatre, uh, Secret World of Og, Carousel Theatre for Young People, and Night's Mare, uh, Caravan Farm Theatre. He also co-wrote the feature film adaptation of the score for CBC television and collaborated with Stan Douglas on his interactive immersive national film board installation circa 1948. His latest uh, project is a suite of virtual reality installations that accompany Electric Company Theater's newest production, The Full Light of Day. Uh, Kevin joins the, uh, joined the University of Victoria's Department of Writing in 2012 and he currently teaches playwriting and screenwriting with a creative focus on cinema, uh, cin cinematic theater hybrids, collaborative creation, site-specific theater, and interactive narratives. Kevin. So today we're going to be talking about creative space making. Uh, I thought we would start today's conversation with a, a, a brief definition um, that I pulled off the net. Uh, this is a slightly antique uh, uh, definition. And then we're going to um, ask each of our panelists to talk about their own thoughts around uh, the definition of creative space making. So this is an early de definition, which defines it as a process where partners from public, private, nonprofit, and community sectors strategically shape the physical and social character character of a neighborhood, town, city, or region around arts and cultural activities. So that's, that's you know, somebody's definition. What about you, Nathan? <laughs> uh, that's, uh, the, yeah, yeah, it's not a term um, that we use day-to-day uh, -day, uh, in, in the uh, nonprofit arts, but uh, I appreciate it's a, it's a term that is, uh, that comes from uh, kind of the, the world of funding and investment. Um, but we certainly do the activity that, that it implies, which is to um, shape um, shape um, the, the the landscape uh, in order to whatever set the stage for uh, creative things to happen, either either things that we f plug into that space or or that we invite the public to to um, take where they want to take it. Um, so it's that that physical um, aspect to it all. And a lot of the work that I do is around um, like uh, almost like re re retrofitting um, institutions, uh, the, the way that they are structured and they, o that they operate in order to um, allow more people to be more creative in inside of them. Um, because uh, just, just like the buildings that, that these institutions are in, um, the way that they work was also set up long ago. Uh, for, for a Canada that isn't really the Canada that we're in um, nowadays. So I think about the physical creative spaces, but also kind of the, the, uh, the, the uh, processes that, that govern those, those spaces and what those uh, invite in or don't invite in. Janet? I, I guess my, um, my experience in this area would be mostly in the uh, creation of uh, or finding and creating temporary venues um, for the for the Fringe Festival, for example. Uh, sometimes finding venues for projects that didn't fit into a traditional theater space. Um, but I, uh, uh, for me, uh, uh, this term brought to mind um, uh, creating opportunities for artists who didn't have access to performance spaces. Um, even if they were temporary ones, even if they were only around for 10 days of the year, um, so that they would have a chance to connect um, with audiences. Mm -hmm. um, and not, not all theater can just be performed out in the public squares. Sometimes the art uh, needs to go in a place that's best suited for it. So um, uh, d developing, uh, giving the opportunities to to emerging artists, uh, uh, opening up uh, the opportunity for new audiences to interact with, with performance, um, and making it feel fun and exciting uh, when these things pop up in a sort of pop up overnight. Um, I love how the, the Fringe Festival always seemed to appear and then totally <laughs> go away. <laughs> um, so, uh, 
yeah, that's, that's uh, creating those temporary spaces, I think, is uh, definitely part of what I'm thinking. Cameron? Yeah, um, <clears throat> that, for all, I guess for me, I think about um, creative space uh, making in terms of, uh, a, you know, a, re a relationship to, um, a reinvigorated relationship with an existing uh, space in a creative kind of context. I think about the origins of our company and how it was really born out of, um, um, well, not, it was born out of a desire to create, but often obstructed by the fact that there wasn't a lot of access to traditional places in which to create. So, you know, the very beginning of Electric Company was at the Fringe in Vancouver because of that accessible um, space to it. But then it became a question of how to invent uh, opportunities uh, when there were limited resources or uh, available kind of traditional spaces. And so we began, um, creating work in site-specific uh, projects where we would uh, build a show in a space that was not a traditional theater venue um, and began, I think, a, a very long trajectory of exploring the audience relationship between the space you're in and the story you're engaged with and how those two things um, are uh, constantly at play and uh, our, any, any space uh, is uh, potentially a narrative experience. Um, and so even when we started to do shows uh, in larger venues or theaters that would be um, kind of dubbed traditional spaces, we always went in with this thought about, I think, how that space was gonna play a role in the story that we told. Um, and became this uh, interchange between creation and um, location. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, you mentioned uh, you mentioned that it's not a term that that that, that we use within the industry per se. Uh, at, at one point, we talked about it being a funder's term. Um, why has it become that? And um, what is the trend in, in within the sector that has made that happen? Well, I think that um, the funders, uh, they've got the money, you know, they can, they can do um, strategic uh, investment um, that, that, that impacts or is targeted on one part of the ecology or, or uh, a whole um, sector uh, or a whole uh, discipline within, within the scope of the, of the funders' uh, work um, in a way that no one nonprofit could, could, could hope to do. I mean, we were part of... Um, Industry associations like, uh, like um, in the city it would be Pro Art, um, and Vancouver the Alliance for Arts. Um, they they they're set up well to do advocacy, but the member fees that they get don't allow them to do um, serious uh, investment. And because in Canada we don't really have a big um, private philanthropy uh, culture in in this country like they have in the states. Um, yeah, it really is the, the public funders who are the big players in, the, in that way. So if uh, someone's going to take up that, that, that way of thinking, it would be yeah, the public funders or, or perhaps uh, the credit unions who get involved with um, social profit uh, investing. Um, you know, pro probably most nonprofit managers would say, I have my own mandate to worry about. I have my own constituents to worry about. I can't think about what's happening in that neighborhood over there unless opportunity knocks and all of a sudden we're making a project there or, or there's a building for sale there. Um, I, I, I think that's, that, that that's a little more opportunistic than strategic. And is that where creative hubs, the, the, I, I mean, it, you know, I, I hear a lot about creative hubs these days and I'm not sure if that's something that's come from the bottom up or the top down. Well, I think, uh, I mean, I mean, I've worked with each of you on projects you could call creative hubs. When, when we partnered with the uh, Conservatory of Music to make the Metro, um, in essence, that was a, now a hub for um, the fine arts that, that didn't exist through, through this partnership that, that, that we made in the different um, communities that, that we were serving uh, through that venue. Um, and similarly in Vancouver, um, we uh, put together the Progress Lab, which ultimately was a co-op, but we didn't even call it a co-op when we got together on it, let alone a hub. We just needed a place to work 
and, uh, and we could make the rent if we all worked together to do that. And there was a, tr there was a tradition of cooperation and in that um, community and, and uh, and, uh, but uh, yeah, and, and then, you know, but to the extent that the funders would like to put labels on it, I think that that's wonderful. And we'll use that language because we, we need the money. <laughs> um. So maybe I can get you guys to talk about, um, about your own history around creative space making. I know that we sort of touched on, on some of those things already, but, uh, but maybe I could ask you to do that. Uh, Kevin, can I get, start with you? Sure. Um, well, yeah, I think you've already eaten a few different ways, and I kind of want to talk a bit about Progress Lab, but I also feel like that would be something um, I'd like Nathan to talk about, because he was such a, an instrumental figure in the making of it, and I just came along and rode on his coattail. <laughs> but the company's beginnings were definitely, as I mentioned, uh, a kind of constant, um, you know, um, exploration of how to, to find and make space to make work happen. And in that way, uh, and, and in the doing of that, beginning to imagine a relationship between space and audience. So that it wasn't just a matter of trying to find, you know, a cheap and convenient place to put on a play, uh, but it was about creating an experience that the audience would encounter a location that they maybe had encountered before, uh, but in an entirely new way, and imagining the joy and excitement of seeing um, a familiar space made new when uh, encountering it. The thing that we're always up against in that process, no matter what, whether it was building a show that was a roving play on Granville Island, or the last show we did, which was just uh, a huge production at the Vancouver Playhouse, is, is that when you're a small, um, a small organization with a pretty finite budget, um, there are you know, just absolutely countless obstacles to trying to occupy a space that normally uh, isn't deemed one that you're supposed to be in. And uh, so for a site-specific show, it was, uh, it was negotiating with, you know, um, multiple different bodies, um, bureaucratic bodies, whether it's the city of Vancouver or the CMHC or community centers, all these places that cohabitated on this one location and trying to create... Um, you know, a collective agreement that we're going to do something there that wasn't going to, you know, wreck the place, uh, but in fact actually make things interesting, uh, a little more interesting for a while. And <clears throat> when we're at the Playhouse, um, which is, you know, a civic theater in Vancouver, it's an old institution, it's one of these sort of spaces that was seemed, um, you know, the right thing at that time. Uh, built centennial project. Centennial project in the late 60s, built... Um, now it seems kind of very antiquated, but it's still, like a, it's still a great theater. It's a big, beautiful venue um, with a lot of seats for people to sit in and see stuff. Uh, but it was a tied to a producing company that kind of, uh, um, you know, it's a whole other creative space story that collapsed under um, the kind of financial impossibility of, of having to constantly produce theater in this very big, expensive venue which itself, you know, is um, uh, tied to all sorts of, you know, structural administrative demands. Uh, the union costs of running that show uh, or that building are very, very, very high. Uh, so it be, uh, the company that, that was producing there uh, folded and it's become kind of just a, a more or less a roadhouse, you know, that's being programmed by the city uh, with presentations and tours and stuff. Uh, we went back to them recently, uh, well, in the last few years, and proposed the idea of a kind of ongoing residency for electric company there uh, to have, once again, a kind of uh, local creative voice in that space. And, um, and, there was, and there was a huge amount of excitement in the community and actually from the city for that idea, but, you know, a lot of, a lot of obstacles as well. It's still a, all a matter of... Uh, trying to find a way to make it affordable. Um, but uh, I think what was seen as um, uh, a really motivating um, uh, force was that, that sense of identity, again, that was kind of lost to that building uh, when its former you know, um, resident uh, disappeared. 
And so that hopefully will be an ongoing. We produced the show a few weeks back, and we have a show coming up next year, another big, huge show by Carmen Aguirre. Um, that's going to be absolutely, I think, quite astounding um, to be producing original work on a really big stage. It's something really hard to do, but, um, but uh, again, I think the excitement around that idea of it happening has allowed for a few <laughs> rules to start to be you know, pushed at and bent and stuff. Not enough yet, but a beginning. Janet? Um, <clears throat> what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> uh, your own sort of his history around uh, oh. creative space making. Yes, well, I, I guess um, uh, I, I inherited uh, the, the job of finding venues for the Fringe Festival and, and renewing those every year. They do. Uh, they still tend to change from year to year. As um, uh, uh, r now, as sites are being redeveloped, especially um, a lot of school gymnasiums that we've used over the years are now uh, being torn down. Church halls, that sort of thing, uh, being redeveloped. And um, so it was a, a constant uh, challenge to find suitable venues. Uh, I spent many, many hours just peering through the windows of empty storefronts, which seemed to be everywhere. Um, and then, you know, calling those numbers and finding out that the, you know, there's, there's nobody to even talk to about using that space. Um, so that was a constant sort of frustration that we, all we needed was room. And there, there were rooms everywhere, but somehow they were just uh, out of the reach. So the greatest success we, we had was uh, partnering with other organizations who had uh, community spaces to just use them for a couple of weeks in the summer. Um, it did sort of define when the festival could happen. Um, it had to happen when everybody was on holiday and before school started. And, Mm -hmm. um, but we did manage to, to secure a, a relatively stable spot on the, on the fringe circuit uh, with those limitations. Um, and then the, the challenge of converting the venues, basically not overnight, but maybe over a night and half a day uh, into usable theaters uh, that were adequately outfitted um, to, uh, to meet the, s the standards that fringe performers have. And you might think, oh, well, they're fringe performers. <laughs> <laughs> do, they, do they have uh, high artistic standards? But you, know, you, do, you, you do need to have, say, a room that is, has high enough ceilings that you can have lighting equipment in it. Um, uh, uh, and hopefully not full of posts. Uh, and th and there's, all, there's all sorts of things, uh, uh, rooms you can black out, um, which is challenging in a, you know, a room full of stained glass windows. <laughs> um, so uh, trying to create good conditions for performers to come to the city um, so that they would feel like their needs were being met in their venues so that they would return and so that they would tell their friends that the Victoria Fringe was a good festival to come to because they were well looked after and the, and the venues were fine. There, in, in other cities, um, sometimes the venues are not fine. Um, and as uh, more and more fringe festivals go towards a kind of bring your own venue uh, model or uh, curated venues, semi-curated venues, um, where a producer programs a venue, um, the, the standards will, will change a little bit. But in Victoria, I think we always tried to give all of the artists an, you know, an equal opportunity to do their best show for an audience. Um, I don't know, did that touch on the That's a, that's a, that's a start. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, before I let you go, I mean, uh, the three of us are connected through our work with Intrepid. Mm -hmm. um, and it, was it 2007, the year of the fire marshal, when, when they closed, was it 2006, when they closed three venues in town? Oh, 
2007, yeah, I thought it was 2007. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know, w we already noticed at the fringe that, that the number of local participants was low, and, and that's, always a, that's always sort of a barometer for, for how the sort of health of the local community. Right, and we were getting two local applications for the Fringe Festival uh -huh. of 40 or whatever the size of the festival was. And we were reserving 50% of the spots in the festival for local companies. So we're only getting two applications. Yeah. Um, so it, it looked like the, the situation was really dire because nobody thought Victoria was, even though their family and friends might be here, it was just too hard mm -hmm. for local companies to make a go of it in any kind of year round way. Harold Street had closed. Harold Street closed. What else closed? The Theater Inconnu. The, 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 the Planet. And the Planet, which was the theater first um, theater that Intrepid ran in the, in the then Eaton mm -hmm. Center. And, and then the three of us started working on the, on the idea of creating a space that would, that would serve our needs for, for, for Intrepid, but also then serve the community year round. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, we already, had, I mean, to a certain extent, we already had a history in creative placemaking because. You know your experience with Fringe. Well, all three of us had had the experience of creating space for Fringe. Uh, we all had. Well, you and I had had a hand in Satco, um, so we had that experience, and and uh, and then we'd also done our, our own work outside of that. That that's true. You know, you you talk about um, developing that muscle for um, laying a creative vision over a random urban space. That really begins here uh, when you're in school between the coursework, you know, if you're in a directing uh, class, um, they're not really, at least in my, my time, they weren't telling you where you had to stage the, the assignment. So I would do it out back um, in that courtyard or, or, or uh, out by the fountain, um, if, if that called for it. And then, uh, and then we had the Satco uh, company, which is, uh, you know, um, pretty limitless. Um, so yeah, you, you do, you do, and I, and that serves me today. I've worked in, I've worked in, um, construction zones ever since I left here. <laughs> First at the Belfry Theater, they were, we, we were opening, um, Studio, what was it called? Studio A? Mm -hmm. Studio A, and finishing the basement, which was then Studio B. Uh, I was the, the house manager ma managing the public traffic all, all, all around, uh, that, uh, work, and then, um, with you guys and, and, the, and the Metro, that was a really swashbuckling project. We had no money and we knew really well how to create spaces for two weeks at a time, but the challenge was to, um, to take advantage of a, a long-term opportunity or to cr create one. Um, but, but in order to um, get the uh, funders to believe that we could do it, we sort of had to, to show them um, what it would look like. Um, so those first days of the Metro, I can remember doing all kinds of um, um, Robin Hood activities in order to fill that room with the right material so that it started to feel like a venue that people wanted to use. And, and uh, you know, there's people in the audience today who took big risks to use that space in its first days um, um, when, when, when there wasn't, um, there, there, there just wasn't the proof of, of concept or a demonstrated ability that, that, that gear would work or that the audiences could find the space and, and, and all of that. That, that, that. Say again? That the rig would stay in the ceiling. Or, you know, the first, and, and, and then there's the, the wonderful um, aspect of surprise in, in, the, in placemaking, which is, which is that you can't predict um, how people will use your space if you position it as a, as a kind of a vessel that people can pr project their ideas into. Whether you can't guarantee that the uh, the, the trumpet section of the of the conservatory won't walk in. Oh my gosh! Show. <laughs> well, I remember the very first um, uh, the very first event that I said yes to at, in the metro uh, was this um, was from the uh, Burning Man community wanted to come in and do a rave, and they were going to give us three hundred and fifty dollars. I thought, oh, wow, what we could buy with $350. <laughs> we could buy a fog machine or we could buy paint for the walls. And, and, uh, but then they came in and, and, and uh, used it. And, and what we learned through that was that, in fact, we had to seal up the windows so that the sound didn't carry to the neighbors across the street or the windows didn't rattle right off their um, frames. Um, 
So, so anyway, so to what, you, what, we, what we had there was an experience of opening a space and um, not really fully um, knowing what it would be good for. And that's been my experience with every, um, with every space. Uh, so I went from there on to Vancouver. We, we, I worked inside the Van Meest Cultural Center, which went through a ma massive, complete rebuild in the time that we had our office there for uh, the electric company. Um, we had been storing our, st we had been using the attic as a storage space for decades. And, uh, and one day it was, you know, you know, we got the grant, you gotta get your stuff out of the, the uh, attic. So we took it all down to the street and we had a big garage sale. And, and what we couldn't get rid of, we then had to find new space uh, for it. And anyway, so that agitated us toward um, opening the pro progress up because we were suddenly uh, homeless. Um, where do I go next? I went to um, the National Arts Center after that and, um, and, and we were under construction my whole time uh, there as well. Uh, you had a brutalist building built in the 1960s um, around the idea that um, people would access the, the building with automobiles. That was the theory in the, in the day and it, was a fro uh, it worked for a while, but, but what it meant was that there was like a driveway around the whole um, facility and it was, it was ter terrible to, uh, to access and people didn't feel like they knew how to get in and if they did get in, were they welcome? So that was a big project in, in placemaking um, to reorient that building so that it faced the city, that it was transparent, open to the uh, open um, to daylight, um, that there were multiple um, unprogrammed spaces that you could come and feel at home in, like non-commercial uh, space that wasn't the public library in downtown that was heated in the winter, cool in the summer, and all kinds of cool um, unexpected things um, have, have been popping up there. I was there last weekend, mentioned to you yesterday, there's a, kind of like a, blo a block party phenomenon has, has emerged there so that this year the NAC's got a DJ in there on Friday nights and a bar and so, so forth. So it's this, uh, this um, youthful um, activity that never was in the building before, uh, before or, or after the shows. Moms and tots come in and, and they decided to park, start parking their strollers over here and that grew, it was a big phenomenon. But it was really was just how the, how the space was, was laid out in the first place. And then the rules that we put or didn't put onto the space, um, you know, we had to really change the attitude of our ushers, change the clothing of our ushers, tell them to, to you know, do this instead of this <laughs> uh, while they were standing there in the day. Because the front entry of the building was, was what the old back entry had been, it exposed a lot of bad habits on the part of our bartenders and things who, staff who would uh, store stuff or not, not clean up properly at night. Um, because then, you know, the next morning, um, all of a sudden, it's the thing that the public was encountering. So it ch had to change, we had to change a lot of our behavior. I remember Peter Herndorf making a, a, a strong point on that, the CEO there, um, how we had to be ready with a new culture on day one at, at the grand opening or, or else it would fail because people's first impressions would be the, like the old impressions. Mm -hmm. um, and now um, I'm in Banff and um, we have another 1960s uh, theater facility. It's, it's two theaters, one 900 seater, one 200 some seater, um, and a whole bunch of classrooms and dance studios adjacent to that. Um, uh, it's called the uh, Performing Arts Complex. We're looking at renovating that now, and, uh, and a big, a big well, well, one thing we're correcting is, is the house of the theater. It's sort of, like, imagine if this room was six times bigger and the seats were flat. So kind of like a movie theater, more or less. Uh, it's be it works best for movies. So we need to do all kinds of things to reshape that house, to, to round it out, to hug the stage, to bring the performers closer, to cut out the back rows um, and make it work better as a creative, live creative space based on what we've learned about how spaces work over the past 40, 50 years. Um, but more than that, uh, we, we're looking at the public spaces outside and uh, how, how it is that we can um, make space uh, that works for different kinds of, pu of public who, who wanna come and engage with the work. Um, you've got the wallflowers who are just there to sit in a seat and they don't, they don't uh, wanna do anything other than sit still and, 
um, be entertained, but then you have people who are like casually active in, in, in the process uh, that they, they, they would jump on their feet if you invited them to. Um, and then you have the people who are like active co-creators and, and uh, eager um, artists who, who themselves need a space uh, either as a hobbyist or, or they're, they're professionally and they, and they need a room to warm up or whatever it, it is that, uh, that, that they might do with that public space. So we're looking really closely at how that's going to be designed. What's the invitation through the architecture, through the policies, um, through the daylight that we, we have, um, the music that's pumping th through, the open hours, um, the menu at the bar, all of those subtle um, cues that, that, that uh, make people feel welcome to, to engage with that space this way or that way. Awesome. I, I feel like we should start talking, we should talk, have a little conversation about branding, but before we do that, uh, because I, I, we talked yesterday about the idea that branding sort of drives this idea of what the, of, about what the space is like, but I think you've already touched on that. But I did wanted to ask about um, what are the most successful drivers for cultural space making? Because I think, you know, we've talked about the fact that it's become a funder's term and that there are grants and there are, there's a push from, from government to sort of create hubs and to do this sort of thing. But, but what, are the, what are the successful drivers? What are the, the, what are the things that are tried and true that we've seen in communities? Well, uh, um, I'll, I'll just jump in. Um, what I have uh, experienced and noticed is, is um, uh, the, that, that often successful, uh, if we're talking about new space projects or, or an activity moving into a, or whatever, a company taking on a, a new space, it's, it's that they've had activity going on and they're so far beyond bursting at the seams that they, that they absolutely uh, guarantee that a new space would, would, be, would, be, would be full. In Ottawa, we, um, had a plan to open a creation lab, which is this building we had identified in Gatineau. It was a, an old um, warehouse that we would um, turn into a, exactly what it sounds like, a lab for um, workshops to, to take place, new works in, in music, dance, and theater. Um, anyway, we went out and tested that on donors, and they, they were hot on the activity that would go into the space, but they were really soft on the space itself and it's because the NAC had no track record of creating work. They said they, you know, so then the, then the, 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 the message was, you know, build your capacity t for the activity uh, and to the point where you have no room to, to do that activity and, and, and that may come in the future. So anyway, the donors, then the plan was reshaped and that's what, what uh, became the National Creation Fund, which launched last year, $25 million raised um, to support creation work from within and from um, companies all, all across Canada. We never got the space, and it's simply because we weren't known for the activity. Um, but on the other hand, we talked about the Metro, we were uh, known for that activity, and we, we were convinced uh, we could fill that space within a year, and we did do that. Janet, do you have thoughts about the drivers that create, the, create creative space making? Uh, well, Sometimes I, I, I think there's, you know, you can, you can recognize a vacuum um, where uh, something should be happening or could be happening and, uh, and you, you look at ways to, to make something happen there. So, I mean, the, the, the venues that uh, Intrepid has had over the years um, have in, in, starting with the planet, which the planet was around for, I think, two or two and a half years. It was up in the top floor of the, the Bay Center um, in undeveloped retail space. So it was just basically a concrete box with a sprinkler system. Um, but it didn't, it didn't pass the fire code <laughs> for some reason. Um, so, but it was, it was really interesting to test out a fringe style space year round because it was, it, uh, a lot of people used it. Um, and I think it helped it to develop that community. It was developing um, a base of users for uh, an independent, uh, affordable theater space in Victoria, which wasn't that really there at the start. Like I said, it, it sort of dried up locally in terms of independent uh, theater production. Um, 
and through the, through the festivals and then developing these other venues, um, more and more companies started to develop. There's more and more demand. And now, um, you know, we could, we could use other theater spaces of other sizes now, I'm sure, in Victoria. Um, uh, in, in, not just larger ones for the companies that are successful and want to move from a 50 seat um, uh, space into a 200 seat space, but um, may, maybe smaller ones, maybe uh, places where uh, more intimate theater experiences could happen or uh, more work could be read and developed um, before it moves on to the next, to the next stage. And I think that while I, was in, while I was at Intrepid, it was always guided by what do the local artists need? Um, what, what could we do to kickstart mm -hmm. the development and to give those artists a little bit of hope that, mm -hmm. that they could uh, create, uh, create work and share it, share it with audiences? And I, so I think that that was always the feeling behind it was how can we um, make it feel possible for particularly local artists to do their work? And how can we bring other artists from outside the community to Victoria to inspire the local artists to, um, uh, to let them know what was going on uh, off the island? So I, th from th I think it always st sort of started with the, where's the vacuum for the, for the artists, rather than what's the, what's the vacuum in the city? Like, what is, it that the pe what is it that people need instead of what, what does the city lack? And, and, and that's one of the pitfalls of, that I've seen in some of the, some of the, the documentation around, around creative space making is the, the, the possibility of gentrification, of, of, of uh, creating a, uh, a vibrant hub that pushes people out of a community rather than embracing them and, and in, enhancing their own experiences. Uh, I, I think you had a story. Yes, time for my <laughs> a great second hand anecdote. <laughs> I was just working, working on a project with um, <clears throat> uh, a, a friend and collaborator, um, a dancer, and, uh, and uh, she'd been developing a dance piece over a period of time, and I'd worked with her a little bit in the early stages, I'd just worked with her in the later stages. In the middle, she went away, she had a residency and performance in Berlin. And she went with some of her team out there to do that. And they came back, and when I checked in with how things had gone, <laughs> One of the stories I heard was that they, uh, well, they loved Berlin, fantastic, fantastic city, so much happening. They found this really cool, not really cool, this, they found this neighborhood, this really affordable neighborhood uh, that they were inspired by how cheap it was there. And not that anybody was planning to stay for any length of time, but they just were sniffing around and they discovered that it was super affordable, but there was basically an unwritten uh, rule within this area, which was no artists, no artists allowed. <laughs> You declare you're an artist, you're not renting here, because they know when the artists come, things get cool, and then people <laughs> want to come, and the rents go up, and they can't live there anymore, so stay away, artists. And like, Amazing, that's awful and fantastic. Uh, yeah, but I was thinking about drivers in terms of uh, creative space, and I think the one, one thing uh, that's a real factor is the idea of access and intersections, I think, are, are, are really important players in what makes a creative space. So obviously, you know, being able to uh, affordably get into a space uh, is a huge thing, but a space in which you're uh, going to have unexpected encounters with, um, with other creators, with other communities, with other voices, is I think a really important um, uh, element of what can make a really vital creative space. And that's what I think was so great about the whole Progress Lab experiment, uh, which was born out of actually, uh, it's a building uh, in, in East Van, um, and it houses four theater companies. Uh, it's an administrative space for the companies, all of these organizations of a similar size that needed a place to do their administrative work. But it's also a studio. Um, and it's a place to build shows. So it's a rehearsal hall, sometimes a slightly illegal performance venue, and, um, and a gathering space. Um, 
one of the, th th it came out of uh, uh, that there had been already quite a, lar uh, like a large collection of similar sized companies in Vancouver that had developed a kind of unofficial uh, collaborative bond, um, which was called Progress Lab. Um, it started as a kind of uh, ex experiment in kind of a, a, kind of a homemade um, uh, symposium, I guess. Uh, at one point, there, we were all uh, looking around and seeing all of this uh, amazing creative activity happening in the city and um, noting that there were these companies that we were watching and working uh, and seeing work and we didn't know how they did what they did and discovered that there was a lot of the same question being asked inside each of these organizations. How do they do that? What are they doing over there? What's their thing? And so we all got together and, and created this um, several day sort of um, conference, I guess, um, where we shared our process and talked to each other about the way we made work. And uh, we brought in guests and, and it became um, a resource sharing kind of enterprise where we shared our ideas and inspiration and our, our systems, but also we began to share uh, capacity with each other to some degree and, um, and became a bit of a united voice for advocacy in the city in terms of promoting theater, uh, independent theater that was at a scale you know, um, you know, bigger than the ad hoc groups and, and the fringe, but uh, not as big as the Arts Club or the then Vancouver Playhouse, that sort of mid-sized crowd. Um, and uh, that, out of that, out of that partnership, which is about a dozen companies, emerged, uh, you know, uh, everybody needed space, but um, these four organizations, um, kind of joined up with a similar set of needs and wants and, um, and uh, I think uh, very different companies creating very different work in very different ways, but yet I think um, somewhat, you know, nicely aligned in the way that they, uh, in, the, in the fact that they were all uh, driven by the uh, desire to create collaboratively. Um, so they, in this, this shared space, this cooperatively run space with administrative um, space as well as creative space was born. And the thing that I really loved about it, and I, you know, I wasn't really uh, there to, uh, you know, in the, in the early days of structuring the, 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 the kind of the business model, but what was really fantastic about it is there was a system where that creative space was, um, you know, every company was guaranteed time in there in a year. It was a bit of a rotating lottery. So you kind of got, you cycled into getting kind of first first round picks of, of dates you needed and, and then the next season you'd move back down to the bottom of the list. But everybody tried to get space they wanted and mostly uh, it worked out fairly well. But it was also, there was uh, time in the calendar reserve that was not taken by any of those companies and that was, that was rental time where other organizations that needed affordable rehearsal space could come in and rent that space. And that rental money helped fund the running of the, 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 the the Progress Lab. Um, it also did interesting things too, like we experienced where um, if the uh, if two companies needed this rehearsal space at the exact same time, um, then uh, one would get that, and the other one would get uh, would find another space, and Progress Lab would pay for that other space out of that rental money, and then it would of course open up more rental time in the calendar year because one company wouldn't be using those weeks. So these little fantastic systems were, were born. And out of that came the idea that there was constantly presence in, the, in, in this organization, not only four different companies working together, working near each other and running into each other in the little kitchen area and having conversations about making theater, but you know, constantly through the year were uh, other artists, companies coming in and working in the space and joining that conversation and out of that, uh, naturally was born new collaborations, new ideas, new initiatives, new, you know, all sorts of new things, new relationships, children, things like that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think intersection as well as access are, is a really powerful driver of what makes a creative space work. Yeah. And clearly partnerships as well. I think all of the stories that you told have, have, have really identified partnerships as a, as a major 
major component of any to develop. And I think back back to the creation of SACO and, and the um, and the administrations, the faculty's willingness to to jump on board the idea was a partnership that wouldn't have made it possible right? if not if if not for. Uh, is there anything anybody's burning to say before we jump into a bit of a Q and A? Because I thought I think we have about ten minutes left, and I thought I'd give an opportunity for the for for those of us assembled to ask questions. Nothing burning. All right. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Or, uh, and, uh, and I am going to repeat your question back for the for the apparently video that they're making of this. <laughs> okay. I guess you've answered oh, all the questions. Oh, sorry, I didn't see. It. Yes, please. <laughs> Brave. That sounds like um, developing your target market. Um, in Ottawa, we had fierce debates about what we would um, partner on and invite as activity into our public space. The new, it was 80,000 square feet added to the building. Um, and we built a, uh, an office of, or a team of um, public space animators, two people whose only job it was to make sure that that space was uh, vibrant, morning, noon, and night, seven days a week. Um, and the idea was they were gonna do this through a mix of uh, bringing some of our activity out into the light from downstairs and um, new community partnerships with, with you know, you know a, hopefully a, a full range of um, cultural communities, uh, associations, and, and schools, and and the like, um, but we had to pin down what we would filter out of the opportunities. Would yoga be in or would yoga be out? Is yoga a performing art uh, and or not? And should we be only focused on the arts in the, in the activities that we, that we had? So we had a, a good, strong debate and it was debatable what that should feel like when people would walk in and what was happening around them. Um, and then we took, we, you know, we made it as specific as, as we thought we should um, to match the brand and, and the other activity that we were selling tickets to instead of um, just uh, allowing to, 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 to um, emerge with no ticket price. So yeah, I guess that, that's, the, uh, that's, the, that's the question. Uh, and there's a company that's really well funded. At Intrepid, we let the ravers in because it was we needed money. It was money, and we needed to spread the word. So, it, so that uh, just just um, opening the door was was going to double the awareness in the city of what we what we were up to. If they actually remembered, they the, <laughs> the police broke that party up. I never told you that. <laughs> <laughs> I managed you always it. used to make. <laughs> People wonder why I left a drop of theater. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, we talked a little. We talked a little bit yesterday about the calling the Metro Studio the Metro Studio and not calling it Intrepid Theater, and it, it really the the idea was that it it be that vessel for whatever came its way, and now more and more it's a vessel for performance, but it was a vessel for like trade shows and mm -hmm. uh, dog shows and all, all kinds of things Church early on. Church Churches, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, uh, so uh, it was important to make it feel like it was just a part of the city and not a part of the mandate of a particular um, presenting company. Mm -hmm. That was also a good debate and, and could have gone another way. But um, yeah, it was the right right call, I think. If I remember, the board was 
very adamant about it being called. The board wanted intrepid the storefront for Intrepid Theater. They wanted us to have um, a physical place for the brand. Yeah, but it was the Metropolitan Hall, and we fought, fought, you know, to 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 uh, bring that out in the brand of the space. And then you know the Intrepid Theater Club that became part of the office then, I guess, gave us that. It was part of the office. Yeah, <laughs> it was the. It was the biggest room in the office. <laughs> Could have been a boardroom, but no, we could have been a boardroom. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Kevin, thoughts about uh, the, the balance between flexibility and mandate and vision? Well, I think that um, uh, you know a lot of it is. It seems to be about serving. You know the the, the sort of utter demands about you know articulate your your vision, articulate, and um, <clears throat> you know I think. In some cases, really, it is about just um, separating the art making part that's happening in the space to the space making part that's happening to support that art. So, you know, we actually formed a separate society in the Progress Lab project called Sea Spaces, which Nathan was a pioneer of, uh, which was about actually that thing that separating the two worlds so that we as artists could just do what we needed to do and articulate our own vision and but the space itself had a vision that was simply about supporting art making and not having to say much more about that but i always think there's a bit of a uh, barrier there with it when it comes to creative spaces in that you know it i think they're just inherently misaligned with um you know marketplace values which are often things that drive those types of demands from above because we all adopt that language and think that somehow that it should be, you know, equally applicable to all parts of society. Um, and I think that, you know, creative space and <coughs> capitalism don't necessarily go really well together. And, and that's, the, that's the biggest challenge is, is always up against these other demands to, um, you know, uh, find ways to fit it into that that marketplace model, and um, and I think the when, the more it gets pushed into those corners, then the less creation occurs. Public library, you know, is like one of the it's like the last place in our society where you can go without demand to spend money. And in some ways, the libraries are the most creative spaces we have today. Those places are absolutely kind of kicking our butts in terms of what they're doing with their buildings and making things happen in there. So. Uh, we probably have time for one last question. Uh, oh my gosh, it's Juliana. Juliana. <laughs> So for the video, I'm just going to say that, uh, that you've asked about uh, the sowing the seeds um, or laying the seeds of, uh, of um, you know, within a, an institution like UVic uh, for, for this kind of creative space making, where, where it grows from. My father is an electrician, and uh, when I was growing up, when any, any room we would walk into, he would look up. And he was looking up to see how the room was wired and what the lighting was. and, and uh, thinking about how he would have solved the problem <laughs> if he had done the work, or maybe his guys did do the work and he was checking it. And this would be any, any room, any restaurant, any hotel, store we, we would walk into, he was always looking up. Um, and I, um, when you ask that question, I think instantly of my dad, because, um, because I guess that, 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 that's something we get here. Um, the capacity to look at any space and say, is this a venue? Could this be a venue? What would I put up here? 
how would I use it? You know, like parkour um, athletes would 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 uh, design their movement through the through the urban space. I think they, I see you nodding, and 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 I'm I'm uh, I'm guessing that that's a big skill we get from from theater school is to, um, yeah, just imagine what can be a theater. Um, anything can be, and. Um, and, uh, and, and then you get out into the real world, you realize these spaces like this are not free. And if you're not affiliated with an organization, you can't af likely can't afford to use it. Um, so, so being can-do artists, we would say, what can we do? Um, and, and necessity is the mother of invention there. And it was a big key to the growth of, and success of Kevin's organization in Vancouver and a whole bunch of a whole crop of theater um, organizations that popped up in Vancouver around 90, 94, 95, 96. Um, it's because they, they uh, um, made their own spaces of the urban landscape. When I walk around Vancouver, I'm looking, just like you were saying earlier, I can't be under the Granville Bridge without thinking of Kendra Fanconi and, uh, and this play called Other Freds, which took place across False Creek, up on the bridge, down, random, People were suddenly revealed to be actors. Um, that's magic, and, and that's my impression of that that space. And and uh, and um, it's 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 an impression that any audience member would would carry forward. I was driving here two days ago, and um, past the uh, Heritage Park, the Heritage Park, where I watched uh, Kevin's play Unity mm -hmm. performed. And uh, yeah, so I don't think of that as a junkyard or whatever. It, 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 is, it is, I only went there once, but it's a historic but site. A bit of magic happened there and, and could again. And um, you thank the artists for that. I don't know if I've answered your question. Uh, well, I mean, I, you know, I think we talked about this yesterday over lunch, this, uh, this idea that, um, you know, I think more and more we've seen that because there's been a movement of creative space making um, and we have, we have a, a younger generation of artists that have experienced creative space making through uh, organizations like Theatre Scam that used Macaulay Point or or Heritage Acres or uh, you know an alley in downtown downtown Victoria, uh, companies like Giggling Iguana Productions that took heritage houses and turned them into site specific theaters, um, the Fringe that was always creating new space. Um, they've experienced creative space making through the process of of the um, of Satco itself. CCPA is having it has had that experience as well, and so we're seeing an entire young generation within this community that are, uh, that are sort of coming out and going, okay, uh, we can create theater wherever we want and be creative makers. And I, I think that's where, uh, you know, I think that's what ties it back to, to this institution. I mean, you know, they, they have an experience of working in a, um, in a traditional space. And, you know, Bert was talking about the, the shock that, that people who work on the rig here or work on, uh, work on, you know, they get to rehearse and build the set and do the show on one stage. <laughs> that doesn't happen virtually anywhere else, right? So, uh, yeah. Anyway, I, I think uh, I have gone on too long. Do you guys have anything last to say before we, we wrap up? Because I realize that we ha have overstepped our time. <laughs> so I just want to thank uh, our panelists. So uh, Nathan, Kevin, and Janet. Um, <clears throat> congratulations, Nathan, on being named the alumni award winner. Uh, and uh, I'd like to thank you for all coming out for this. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the alumni department for, uh, for putting on Alumni Week, and I'd like to thank the Phoenix for their support of, of hosting us today. So thank you very much. Uh, I think there is a very short presentation to be made uh, before we leave the stage. <laughs> you don't have a microphone. Oh, look, wrapped presents. <laughs> presents. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. Oh. <laughs> a mug. Creative st future start here in a cup of coffee.